we've got four excellent folks joining me today who bring uh, very different perspectives, so I'm excited for this conversation. Um, just to my left here is Matt McKnight. Matt is the general manager for Ginkgo's biosecurity business, which we call Concentric by Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, prior to building that platform, Matt was our chief commercial officer on the cell engineering side, and so uniquely brings that you know, sort of connectivity between the opportunities that we've been seeing on bioengineering with the necessity to build a biosecurity platform. Um, Matt previously has supported the development of uh, BD at Palantir Technologies. Um, he's also an active venture investor, um, and earlier in his career served as an officer in the United States Marine Corps. I've also asked all of our panelists for a fun fact, and this one I didn't actually need Matt to tell me because I've seen photographic mm -hmm. evidence. Uh, Matt and his family were all dressed up as Avatar not more than about 12 hours ago <laughs> uh, in the United States for, for Halloween. Um, to Matt's uh, left, uh, we have Dr. Cassidy Nelson. Um, Cassidy is the head of biosecurity policy at the Center for Long-Term Resilience. Um, she's a dual-trained physician scientist who completed her doctor of, her PhD in biology at Oxford and her medical degree at University of Queensland. Um, prior to her current role, Cassidy spent a decade as a doctor in clinical medicine and infectious disease in Australia and as a biosecurity researcher at the University of Oxford. Um, she's advised internationally on health security policy and has served as a consultant to the World Health Organization, the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, and RAND Europe. Her fun fact is that she's an avid backgammon player, which I also am, so we've learned some, some commonality here. Uh, next to Cassidy, we have Dr. Gideon Henderson. Um, he's the Director General for Science and Analysis and DEFRA Chief Scientific Advisor. Professor Henderson was appointed Chief Scientific Advisor um, in 2019 and is responsible for overseeing the quality of evidence that the department relies on for policy decisions. He's also been a professor of earth sciences at the Department of Earth Sciences in, at the University of Oxford since 2006. And we had to use ChatGPT for his fun fact, which said that his fun <laughs> fact is that he's used coral reefs to study past climate changes by analyzing the isotopes in coral skeletons, researchers like Dr. Henderson can gain insights into historical climate patterns. And so he describes himself as, a, <laughs> describes himself as an isotope geochemist, and I still have no idea what that means, um, but we can ask him <laughs> after. Um, and then last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Matilda Rode, um, who's the AI and cybersecurity lead for the British Standards Institution. Um, she previously worked in cybersecurity at Airbus and received her PhD in dynamic malware detection with machine learning at Cardiff University. Uh, Matilda developed a cat facial recognition software, or attempted to, but apparently did not end well. And so, uh, again, good conversation starters after. Um, I'm going to start us off. I will, we will leave plenty of time for questions, and so please get those, get those in your mind as we go through. Um, but to kick us off, I'll do another little icebreaker, if you all don't mind. Um, my favorite dinner party conversation now is personal use cases for AI. Um, and so truly cannot be about work. What is your favorite personal use case of AI? Matt, you can start. You want me to go first? Yeah, go for it. I generally, uh, so that, this is unfair because I've been at the dinner party where she's asked this question. <laughs> um, so I've thought about different versions of it. But my favorite one actually is related to dinner parties or business dinner parties, which are generally boring. I think people uh, don't, don't necessarily enjoy them as much as, they, as you think. And what you can do is you take each person's bio, right, and then add a few, like, features of that person that you might not know, put it into... I'm sorry, you do this when you invite your friends uh -huh. over for dinner? Absolutely. Okay, you, you do bio, bios for your oh, friends? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's just... 100%. <laughs> just like making and sure then, this but is a then, personal but then thing. You put in all the weird things that you, you, you're like interested in what the model's gonna come up with, and you ask, project this person's future. Oh, fortune telling. And then you get the fortune telling of that person's future, and it makes for a great dinner time, dinner time conversation. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, for me, no, it definitely has to be that um, it's really useful for finding um, dinner recipes with my with my husband. Uh, you can just enter just the few ingredients you might have, and then it comes up with right, creative. Favorite AI dinner recipe? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it comes up with very good salads. Yeah, no. I, I, it's it's quite creative. I do have to say, like, uh, we're 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 expecting our first child, and it's not good at coming up with baby names, though. I've not, <laughs> <have> not been <laughs> impressed and have not found one yet. So. <laughs> So I'm going to end up cheating, but I'm going to start off sticking to your rules, uh, which is that this is a personal example in my, in my private life. 
I, I like to use apps that enable you to uh, identify natural things, so identify mm -hmm. flowers or um, birds or you know, by, the, by the acoustics or the visuals. Um, and um, so I, and the, some of those are driven by AI. They have AI in them. And the reason it's actually, I'm cheating a bit, because it's also a professional interest for me in DEFRA is we, the data that comes from those sorts of tools um, is potentially really powerful, but often quite flawed, because I'm, I'm lousy at flowers. If I identify something as a marigold, it probably isn't a marigold. Um, but AI can help you sort that out, um, and we're getting more data by use of AI in that context as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my one's probably quite boring, but I'm quite evangelical about it, which um, is <laughs> like doing um, object recognition on your photos in your phone. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever sat with someone, and they're like, yeah, let me find it, and they're scrolling for so long. Mm -hmm. And then now you can just be like, July, beach. <laughs> um, <laughs> there it is. That is great. Yeah. Mine is bedtime stories for my kids, which if any of you have kids or nieces and nephews, it is remarkably good at personalized stories for them. <laughs> Um, Dr. Henderson, I'm going to start with you. Um, I'd like to start on the positive note of the opportunities of the intersection of AI and biology. Um, and there's this sort of duality between the <coughs> opportunity and the risks. And, and I think you probably sit in the middle of that duality in, in your role. Um, and so I'd be curious kind of what you spend your time thinking about as it relates to that dichotomy and, and perhaps how to achieve that unstable equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So you, you'd get a very different answer if you had a, a CSA from a different department here. Certainly if you had someone from the human health side, from our Department of Health, you'd get a much more human health um, answer. But I sit in, um, in DEFRA, and the E is for environment, and the F is for food. And, and both of those are areas which are fundamentally biological. I mean, as you said in your lecture, food is biological, and environment is a biological um, space that we live in. So my answer is going to be along those, those lines. But I am a, I'm a scientist in government, and one of the things that um, is really shaping science thinking at the moment is the Science and Technology Framework document. For those people who are interested in UK science policy, it's a great document. You should have a look at it. It's easily downloadable, nice and short and punchy. And I'll probably return to it a few times. And one of the things that it is championing is engineering biology as a priority technology that we should be using more. I really welcome that because the other technologies are not bio at all. That's a very bio technology, that, um, which is a broad church. And two of the themes within it that I um, that DEFRA really cares about is agriculture and food. You talked about the ability to use precision breeding, effectively gene, gene editing, to build better crops. And that's an area which DEFRA has been legislating about recently to enable it in the UK. And very exciting for all the reasons that, that you mentioned about better use of nutrients, um, pest resistance, and such like. And the other one is animal health, where our ability to build drugs um, for animals as well as for humans is being dramatically enhanced. And in both of those areas, it's not just our understanding of biology, but it's the use of AI tools increasingly that are helping us to look at those. And both of those have got tremendous opportunities, but they both also carry risks. They can be used in a way that is um, hostile or negative, so we are also aware of that and think about it from a threat narrative, um, um, how they might be misused. But for me, that they are a massive opportunity of things that we might be able to do to en enhance outcomes for humans. How do you think we build trust? Uh, you know, we we come from an industry where you know bioengineering and areas like agriculture has been a scary topic. Um, and there's a, a, a big anti-GMO movement across Europe that mm -hmm. you know is is something we've we've had to discuss and, and talk about. And, and I'm curious as we think about advancing technologies in areas that are personal to us, like our food, what we're putting in our bodies, how do you think about building, building that trust and that understanding? Yeah, I've, I've had to be very aware of that in the last couple of years as we've taken uh, law, new law through the UK Parliament um, to allay, enable precision breeding of mm -hmm. crops. Um, a couple of the lessons that I've learned from that are communicate all the time, wherever you're asked, no matter who the audience is, to be willing to talk to people, often people who are instinctively hostile, it's always better to engage with them and talk to people. Um, we've also taken a policy which I think has worked of really trying to move um, in small steps so you don't try and jump too far in one go. The public lose trust in the system if you move a little way and make sure that it's safe and, and people are content with it and the pub you've got public license to act before you move again. I think that's one of the ways that you can really make sure you take people with you. Appreciate that. Um, Cassidy, before we dive into what a biosecurity solution might look like. I was hoping you could just help us frame 
the risk, you know, for this conversation, um, you know, that sort of risk space at the intersection of biology and AI. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, at, at, at this intersection, I do think it's just really important to recognize there is a double-edged sword. Uh, there, there's going to be incredible advances from AI and from, from my past life wor wor working in medicine. Um, I'm very excited about what's this, what this is going to do in diagnostics and therapeutics, uh, but it can also be misused. And so I spend my professional time now thinking on misuse risks. And uh, there's two broad categories by which we can kind of think about the way this might enable bad actors, uh, one of which is through lowering barriers. Uh, this is uh, through decreasing the difficulty, perhaps, in, 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 in causing harm, uh, as well as increasing the height of possible harm that could, that, that could occur. And so I think it's really important in these conversations to, to get a sense of a calibrated understanding of just where this risk is actually coming from, as well as uh, whether or not we're, we're, we're in a situation where, where the risks uh, uh, are at risk themselves of, of being overstated or that we actually don't recognize uh, and we might be blindsided by some of the risks that, that come through. So we've done a lot of work, uh, my, my team at CLTR, thinking on where, where in the risk chain, if you, if you visualize out steps that someone has to go from in, intention to cause harm to, to an event actually occurring, where is AI actually enabling someone? What, what, in what way uh, is, is this actually a uh, risk that, that we feel is, um, is, is uh, technologically mature at the moment or at the moment actually not, uh, not quite as enabled as, as, as one might think? And so I think this is just really important, thinking on uh, di different steps within, within, this, within this risk chain, uh, us getting a more sophisticated understanding of, of where risk is actually coming from. This is going to be very important for us to actually, uh, actually get to a point where we go, where do we want to intervene here? Where, 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 where do we want to make sure that, that, that we, we, don't, we don't stifle uh, benign uses of AI, but we also aren't blindsided by, by some of the risks that might be coming out? All right, Matt, there's risk. <laughs> You're building a business to try to protect us from that risk. Can you help us frame like, what practically exists today that we can actually do today to help this problem, and where do you see it going from here? Yeah, I think it's super interesting. It actually connects um, to, Professor, what you were saying. I think the, there's like two big foundational things to, to realize, and, and Emory, you mentioned the kind of key one in my mind which is it's like how to get your mind around what's happening in biosecurity technologies today, it's that we are on the vertical part of an exponential curve. So with respect to biotechnology broadly and then specifically where all the places biology meets the economy, so that's not just in human health, right, that's in agriculture, and each of those nexus points needs to be secured just like we would secure all the places where a computer meets a thing. Right, and I think that's number one. The, the, the second one, which is very connected to this AI conversation, but Anna-Marie, also to your talk and obviously how we think about it at Ginkgo, is this idea of where the digital and physical interface exists and how do you go between digital and physical. And in the new era of bioengineering, like that is actually the, the kind of crucial thing to get right. So those are like two big ideas for how we think about what technologies need to be, to be built. And anytime you've created an engineering discipline, whether that was chemical engineering or turning physics from theoretical into something human controlled or computer engineering, you've like had this moment where you said, okay, now I need to use those same technologies that we're gonna build amazing economic capabilities out of and use them for security uh, in, in that domain and others. So uh, like a very practical example I'd give you about this digital physical interface and uh, and how to use modern biotechnology is what we're doing with the CDC uh, in the U.S. and now globally, where we think of uh, we think of our detection systems at airports like biological radar. And what we're really doing is digitizing the environment. An airplane lands, and we are pulling wastewater off of the airplane. It is as disgusting as it sounds, but we have a special device that pulls wastewater directly from the plane right before when they plug it in, and we immediately move it through a system to get it to a DNA sequencer. And within four days, we're returning. Uh, uh, variant information of different pathogen th pathogenic threats to public health authorities. And we're doing this in the US, we're doing this in the Middle East, we're doing this in Africa, we're doing this uh, across many countries now. 
But what that really is is an aspiration to think, okay, I gotta digitize the environment because I need to be monitoring the ATCs and Gs all the time, like I monitor zeros and ones in the cyber world. But that's like one practical application of modern tools of biotechnology sequencers to this idea of uh, making sure we think about biology in a different way than we have in the past. All right, Matt mentioned some zeros and ones. So Matilda, <laughs> I'd love to go to you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I alluded to it earlier, but I think there's a lot that we could be learning in the biosecurity industry from the way that the cybersecurity industry developed. Um, and so just thinking about the problem space here and then also maybe the relationship between the private sector and public sector, um, I'd be curious if there are any particular lessons that we should take or things that we should do differently um, in that history and if you could paint a bit of the history of cybersecurity and how it got to the $150 billion industry it is today. Yeah, it's funny to talk about um, taking lessons from um, cyber to biology because we use so much biology terminology in cyber like virus, vector, <laughs> poor cyber hygiene. There's a very famous company that has like an immune system product. Um, yeah, so so it's, it's an interesting space and at, you know, the the history of um, viruses, um, computer viruses, um, really only began when computers started getting networked together. And I think that's where the language comes from because of the capability to spread because mm -hmm. computers predated um, networking. Um, and the reason cybersecurity industry is so massive is because basically every company in the world uses computers and IT infrastructure to function. Um, not every company is going to be using biological artifacts, but as you pointed out earlier, we are made of biology, so we should be quite concerned about mm -hmm. uh, that as well. And, it, you know, in terms of learning from the history of, of cyber, I'm sure um, it, it depends who you'd, who you'd ask from the profession, but a couple of things I'd point to is um, we, we'd see new technologies getting adopted, um, we can look at AI now, but um, in the past, things like moving everything to cloud, um, adoption of IoT devices, and cybersecurity professionals getting very frustrated that we will be seeing attacks that we already know how to defend, um, but they're not uh, protected in the products when they're going to market. And why is this happening? Because we already know how to build in security from the beginning with these products. And I think the reason for that is that it's a new group of developers who were specialized in producing those products and um, everybody talks a lot about security by design and that, that needs to be kind of inbuilt into the DNA of the people who are doing cutting edge research and there, there is a lot of push to go to market early and, and we need to somehow build structures in that, that kind of stop us uh, for foregoing security. I think it very much sector dependent because safety is in the DNA of certain sectors and, and they, they uh, won't forego that. but. Um, you know, that there are risks as, as people, you know, have kind of personal research projects and things like that. What has um, been government's role in, in cybersecurity, whether it's on the standard side, which obviously you spend a lot of time on, but also the innovation side of cybersecurity? And, and Professor Henderson, I'm going to send that same question to you because I do think there's an interesting interplay between private research and public Regu either regulation or support. On yeah, I mean, this is interesting seeing that, like, the bodies that have sprung up in the UK, like we have the NCSC and then, like, CISA in, in the States that are um, government bodies that protect cyber infrastructure nationally and they, they look after specific um, groups of industry and maybe that's something that, you know, biosecurity can, can look to do instead of saying, ah, this sector really needs some help, we should set up a government organization to help them maybe, you know, tr trying to kind of anticipate that need. Um, yeah. Mm. Professor Henderson, I'd, I'd send the same sort of question to you. Um, you know, obviously, in our, in Ginkgo's biosecurity business, we work with many governments around the world. It, it does seem, in, in many ways, because biology doesn't respect borders, <laughs> that this becomes an international issue very quickly versus a private sector issue. Mm. But we have this interesting interface right now of private sector companies developing technologies and leading the charge, but needing the involvement and support of, of international bodies and, and governments. And so knowing it's, it's a little bit outside of your department, I'm, I'm curious if you can comment on how the government is thinking about. Although, although cyber security um, is outside of my department, certainly biosecurity is, is part of it, is quite distributed risk because it's certainly a risk to animal and plant health and, and therefore our crops and, and ability to live. Um, so that, that is part of DEFRA's remit. 
um, we have quite a number of areas where we, are, we have to regulate or um, think about government, the government role. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned um, precision breeding, genetic ed editing of crops. That's certainly an area where we very actively thought about the best place to land regulation. But I did threaten in my opening remarks that I might say, uh, right, refer again to the science and technology framework. So that is a very science and tech way of looking at it. There are 10 things that that says we should do for UK science. And it's worth actually reading, I'm not going to do all 10, but if you think about what government's role is in this space between um, biotechnology, AI and security, uh, there are quite a lot of, there's quite a lot of resonance. So I, I, I didn't identify critical technologies, engineering biology is identified as one of them. Um, invest in R&D, so certainly one of the things to do is to invest in the, in the research, not only about the biotech, but about the security that needs to come with it. Talent and skills is one of the themes, and we've got to have people with the skills on both the doing it and protecting against nefarious use of it. Encouraging private investment is another one. Infrastructure, I know you talked about the need for infrastructure. You know, the equipment that we build things with and the equipment that we police the system with is also important. And of course, regulation and standards that um, we've touched on already is a, crit is a critical role for government. And the last, of the, I've done quite all 10 of them, I've nearly done all 10, but the 10th of the things is an innovative public sector. And that's also actually what we need here. We need a public sector that understands biotech, understands biosecurity in the same way that it's been forced to understand uh, cybersecurity. So a long list of government roles, I think. Yeah, I, I do think it's interesting, and in, I, I may be incorrect in this assumption, but my assumption has always been, Matilda, that in cybersecurity, most of the investment comes from corporations that are trying to avoid financial loss, effectively, um, and consumers. But that less of it is there. There's obviously there is obviously large cyber investment and 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 uh, sort of focus at the government level. But that much more of the push came from kind of the economic side of of that equation, which relied more or was able to get more support from the private sector. Whereas again, in biology. Companies often think about this as a public health issue and an epidemiological issue and therefore not the responsibility of an individual company But rather the responsibility of government to protect mm -hmm. us um, Is that a fair do you think do you think it's a, a fair? Comparison or co contrast or have you seen much more government involvement on the cyber side? Yeah, I do think I do think that um, the fact that you know suffering a catastrophic cyber attack can annihilate a company, uh, makes companies very motivated to invest in it. Um, and, you know, we see huge adoption of, uh, like, cybersecurity standards. Um, it's one of the most heavily adopted standards areas because it's aligned with that business risk. Um, but also we see a lot of um, companies and governments sharing information together because even though it can be commercially sensitive, you know, there's this kind of stronger together attitude and people understand within the industry that they really need to play that role and, and governments um, have played like important facilitating roles there not just nationally but globally and you know this whole kind of network of um, communities around that and that that could be something that would be I think very important mm -hmm. to, to replicate in this space if it doesn't exist already. Would you mind if I quickly jump yes. in on that? So it's a very interesting analogy I think and that and the thing about biosecurity is that we absolutely fundamentally rely on food and health. I mean, humans can't exist without those things. Um, and therefore, the biosecurity is, very, is a very dis distributed risk, and maybe that's why there's more of a role for government. In the early days, computers were not like that. When they, were, they were nice to have, but they weren't essential. Maybe they are becoming more and more essential, and so much of our systems rely on them that the role for government is doubtless expanding as, as that happens. I think the two other sort of frameworks that people look at this with, besides the sort of economic risk that you know, we see prevalent in cyber, there's one kind of public health, and I know, Cassidy, you spent a lot of your time thinking about that role, and then there's national security as well. Um, so maybe I'd, I'd just open it to the two of you to think about how, how have we seen other, either kind of pub public health or national security priorities get off the ground successfully and how, how might we apply that to biosecurity? Either of you. We st I, as we've seen in COVID, we still have a long way to go in, in, in public health and pandemic preparedness, but um, uh, there's, there's quite a few good positive developments going on, especially I, I'm quite excited by, by, by 
uh, potential developments, things in the early detection space and our ability to kind of catch things early going forward. I think it, it, there's, there's going to be uh, quite a bit of revolution in our ability to, to, to respond more quickly as well. 100 day mission from CEPI is, is just quite, quite, quite exciting. I think there's, yeah, just, just quite a bit there. Maybe I'll let you speak to the national security point. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's like, this is like the hardest um, thing to get right, which is, is this problem that we're talking about with respect to out of control biology, catastrophic biological incidents, is it a ultimately where it's set, set for a long time, a public health problem, or is this something we're going to truly decide to invest in as a piece of national security, a national security threat, and thus national security infrastructure like we would approach other catastrophic threats. And I think, I, I've been pretty unabashed. We have incredible partnerships with CDC, public health agencies across the US, and think these are very much dual use defense technologies, public health technologies, but I've been pretty unabashed like that we need to 100% think about this as a co-equivalent national security challenge with things like nuclear, with things like cyber. And, and there's like some foundational reasons for that. One, everybody's heard about the pandemic uh, boom and bust cycle. We don't have that problem in national security. We, we spend a lot of money in the US, over a trillion dollars a year, building essentially umbrella protection for preventative situations to reduce overall systemic risk. That is clearly the dynamic with biology, especially in the biological engineering era. We, so we have to think about it like that, and that will have massive, massively important spillover effects to public health. I think the, the second one, which is really changing dramatically, and just like to say it out loud, the, the US Biodefense Posture Review, which just came out a couple months ago, was very explicit on this pretty much for one of the first times in a kind of national level document. Nation states, are really the threat here, and nation states, there are a set of nation states that do not abide by the Biological Weapons Convention. And there's a new era of capability that exists on the planet in biological engineering, and there are bad actors who will seek to weaponize that technology. And if that is true, and the US names, and it's a public document, names North Korea, Russia, and Iran, and then it is circumspect on China, and specifically notes that while it will not say directly that they are violating the Bioweapons Convention, they are very concerned about a set of dual use capabilities that are being developed and explored. And so if that is true, we need to look at the defensive infrastructure without hesitation and with an alacrity that we are not looking at it today to build the, build the ability to stop any sort of threat that might be used. And by the way, whether we wanna believe it or not, in human history, every time something has been made engineerable, actors have used it in human conflict. So we should just like understand that is the reality of history and unless we're gonna change the reality of history, which is not like ultimately something that we as humans have a lot of great track record in doing, we better make sure that we build defensive capabilities. And just like the last thing I'll say, it's probably not some crazy engineered virus where one population is protected and the other population dies. It's probably not that insane because we have plenty of ways like in the geopolitics of the world to punish bad actors. It's probably something much more insidious, like you see with cyber, with misinformation, disinformation. Wars have become much less kinetic over time. It is how biology in all its ways disrupt modern society, how they bleed economic and political will. Look at, look at the lessons of SARS-CoV-2, is that you can fundamentally damage the foundation of democratic societies, elections, economics, with a virus that was very bad, but really kind of just something that created a lot of human strife. So people that seek to change the global order see that as, you know, th there's definitely people learning from those things. And it is only the ability to understand where things come from, early warning, detection, attribution. Those types of technologies are what protected us in the nuclear era. They're what protects us in the cyber area, era, and we need to make sure that we're building the capabilities to do that in the uh, biological engineering era as well. Um, so I, I firmly, uh, clearly you can hear, like I think that this has to be a national security topic, uh, and we can come back to like where the nexus with AI is on both the BDT side and the LLM side, but like that, it, that just only accelerates the, the need to kind of approach this in a holistic manner. Matilda, one of the things that you addressed earlier was that like one of the vulnerabilities in cyber is the ability to kind of look into the future um, like ransomware wasn't always a thing, and now it's a new tool people are using, um, and so it's hard to build in this kind of secure by design concept. Um, 
I'm convinced, certainly, that biosecurity needs to be a national pri an international priority for multiple reasons, public health, national security. How do you think about future-proofing that infrastructure that's so critically important? Yeah, yeah, it's true that you never know uh, what opportunities are going to arise for adversaries, and it's very important to realize that um, manipulating like biological biotech infrastructure is just one of the um, tools in the toolkit of an adversary, whether it's a nation state or like an economic crim criminal or um, like somebody looking to do IP theft or something like that. Having um, in, in the cyber world, you know, even when those new um, threats arose, the companies who got hit very badly and were seen, um, you know, were, were reported in the press didn't have kind of cybersecurity best practices in place. So you can kind of protect yourself to a certain extent and by, you know, um, following best practice. And there's there's a lot of um, tools that can be borrowed from, from cyber. I was thinking a lot about, you know, like canary tokens that we have to trigger when like an actor has been in a certain space, mm. so you have some like fake mm. artifact that you that you find later, and um, it's just it's just a it's a difficult problem, right? If you want to break into a car and steal something, you smash a window. You could like copy the key through the letterbox. You could like jimmy the door. You could like just dis distract the person while they're You're locking the car, too getting much their time kids up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my Tell car. More. I always forget to lock my car as well. Um, yeah, and and mm. each of those. Like is for a cyber analogy, each of those attack pathways has a whole group of specialists around it. So for like, um, we have cyber awareness teams who protect people against phishing. We have incident response teams. We have risk managers. We have vulnerability managers, um, and all of those people are accompanied by a huge suite of technology that helps them do risk assessment and judge things. And just to like make it a little bit more hopeful, um, actually, um, like machine learning technologies are one way that helps us ingest and analyze even more data because you can't protect yourself against absolutely everything. It's all about prioritization and where you place your resources and where you um, put your risk priorities, I, I think. So all joking aside on the number of ways you've thought about breaking into cars, um, red teaming is something that we talk about as it relates, again, to this intersection of AI and biology. Um, but really, any of these, <laughs> any of these technologies, how, how can you test whether that technology is capable of doing the things that we're scared about and who are the experts who are doing that and how do we approach it. Maybe, Cassie, I'd throw this to you. Um, how do you think about the role of kind of red teaming platform technologies? And how do, you, how do you think about the importance or role of that in a world where this technology is so distributed? Like, if we just use OpenAI as the example, yeah. I'm confident that they're going to be responsible, you know, and how they're building it. it. It didn't tell me a made up fun fact about Dr. Henderson. Unfortunately, I tried this morning. Um, but it's trivially easy to make LLMs now. You know, like it will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper for folks to do that. And you can't red team every single model that exists out in someone's basement. And so how do you think about the role for that, the role maybe for large platforms in a more distributed world? Yeah. So at the end of the day, I do think we need to have a, a Swiss cheese model of being able to at least reduce some of the risk here. And I do think evals, uh, evaluations of models and their capabilities, as well as red teaming, do just have a very strong place, even if it doesn't, it's not a catch-all. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned LLMs, and there, there, yeah, there are companies that are uh, very much committed to being able to do red teaming and, and understanding the capabilities of their models. Uh, you unearth dangerous capabilities that you may have not been aware were, were in your model. I do think, though, we have done a lot less thinking on how to do this across a wider range of AI, AI tools that, 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 are, that are emerging uh, or, or are already quite, uh, quite much in use already. And this is much more tricky in, in, in a few different ways. Uh, the, some of these tools are being developed by, 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 by large developers. Others are being developed by research groups who might not be thinking about things from a biosecurity lens or might not have the resources of open AI to, to you know, hold red teaming exercises and the like. I think also it's, it's just important to note that we haven't actually arrived at a gold standard yet for red teaming or, or, or evals. That there's, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in actually going, how do we actually ensure that we can understand each, the actual capabilities of a model, including in particular, from the angle I look at it from, the dangerous capabilities of a model. Because it's, it's not always what it says on the tin, <laughs> unfortunately, of, what, of the use. Or, there's can be, or there can be a misuse case as well, too. So this is, this is, a, this is a part 
of, of the problem, and I do think there's a role as well to say for national security to be involved in this as well too, for the understanding of what you're actually trying to, uh, what, what, what you're actually trying to ascertain a model can do requires a national security lens, require, requires the, 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 the intelligence community on board with this as well too. And so therefore it comes to, to, to government of whether or not there should be capabilities built within government to be able to do these types of assessments and then first be able to actually understand uh, wh where the state of the play is at the moment. I don't think governments around the world necessarily do fully have a good sense yet uh, of, of full capabilities. Uh, but then also then, what are our actual mitigation options with regards to this based on, based on the state of play? You said, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> one, one quick thing you said, Kelsey, you said highlighting something you didn't even know your model could do. Yeah. And I think that's important to, touch on just a little bit longer in biology because e even in just human language, again, remember, we invented human language, we kind of know what's out there. When GPT-4 came out, everyone was shocked by what it was capable of doing. But what it's capable of doing is stuff we've already done and we've already thought up and is you know, out on the internet somewhere. I, I do think there is a really interesting kind of question around like as these AI models start to understand biology better than we do, how do we start getting to, and we don't really understand how it's learning, right? This kind of unsupervised learning approach means it, it is a bit of a black box. How do we get to the, br the broad set of questions we need to answer to be able to really elucidate what these models and tools in general are capable of? It's a, it's a very difficult problem and the AI safety field at large is really struggling with this. Uh, you have, being able to understand actual capabilities, especially because yeah, they're not necessarily uh, apparent um, from, from just first principles of how you've designed um, an AI tool. And I do think though that, that we, we, we shouldn't despair that there is progress that we can make here and there, there, there is just quite a bit more developments we need to do of having more robust systems that could actually do the evaluations to, to, to uncover these capabilities, do, do, do the types of uh, activities that we need to actually understand this a bit more. Um, and also really, really be looking forward to the future as well too of where it, situations that you can get blindsided by, which is when these types of tools combine as well too. So if you could use natural language to call RF diffusion, or if you could, if you could, if, and you you don't necessarily need to uh, be limited in the same ways that 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 that, that uh, scientists today are limited. I think this is a, a difficult thing for our for humans at prod to do is do this type of uh, intersectional point assessments, uh, but I, I think it's very necessary. Otherwise, we will be we, we will be blindsided. Yeah, yeah I just this is awesome. I want to just jump in because I think that the like this this last year has been like really transformational for in two ways for how to think about the Swiss cheese model, if you will, right? Like Swiss cheese model being like layered defenses, right? You should have regulation, you should have test evaluation, and this is whether you're talking about LLMs in the English language world or you're talking about what we do in bio, but also detection, monitoring, and response. And right? they're all bad in different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully but, but together like two, catch each other. Right, exactly, <laughs> but like two really cool things have happened. I think at least if you look at governments of the world, one, this kind of like, it's like been like an oh shit moment, which was like we we kind of like I think thought they say, oh bloody hell oh bloody hell <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like we can't like for so many years we would talk to the White House and others about this like we're gonna we're gonna there's gonna be regulation and there's gonna be rules and then that's how we're gonna kind of control AI and different things like. DNA synthesis, you know, printing DNA, who gets to do it, what kind of sequences do they get to print out, but we're gonna control that kind of top down. And that, that's like an important piece of the Swiss cheese model, but like if, if we just saw another, my other thing was I used Claude 2 because I love the upload function, to summarize the 100 page document the Biden administration put out, which has a lot of good stuff in it, but it's like <laughs> all the ways we want to try to tell people to be better. Right, and not, not a ton of, oh, we actually know now that there are things we won't know how to control. They will, whether it's because we can only control the things in our own nation states and other nation states are gonna do different things or other groups are gonna do different things. We can't control everything, so we also have to build, there's just been this realization that we actually have to build a defensive like detection and response capabilities because there's gonna be leakage on these things. So you have to have both, but like just the realization that you had to write 100 pages to try to like cover a bunch of different things from general AI to bio, like if you look at that document, literally it's, it's 100 pages. Um, so I think that that's one, and then just on the bio side, I think what's 
a neat realization, something I worry about a lot. So if you look at where the big three threats come from in the threat surface of bio, it's natural. We encroach upon new uh, natural lands. Climate change changes the kind of dynamic of humans engaging with the environment. New pathogens will emerge. It is labs who are trying to do good things and just make mistakes, and it is, it is bad actors, right? It is, it is human, human created threats. Well, that second one is where a lot of the like, different things emerge from labs, and the explosion in people and nations doing highly sophisticated, relatively dangerous research, you can just look at the map of how many BSL-3 and 4 labs are being built around the world today, is really scary, and not all countries have the same biosafety standards. Even if they did, statistics are statistics, right? And so if you look at that, these tools, and this is the world you live in, but like, we have the ability in some ways to reduce the need for the risky research that happens at the digital to digital to physical interface. If you can do it computationally with the right controls, if you, can, if you can look at this very important research around how to build therapeutics, how to build vaccines for dangerous threats, you can reduce the kind of physical risk of people doing it like actually at the lab bench. So there's, there's the, the, the kind of negative part to it, but then if we bring some of these problems into the digital domain, we can like be really much more kind of risk controlled about what is very important defensive research. And you know, so I think that these like, how do, you, how do they use these tools have the kind of both sides of that, uh, both sides of that coin. Yeah. Matilda, I wanna talk about standards a little bit. Um, the 100 page executive order talked about a lot of mm. standards and reporting and you know, regulation and how that's all the stuff that Claude cut out <laughs> <laughs> how do you think about how do you think about the role of, of sort of standards um, you obviously work in that space to kind of see us through <laughs> through these kind of questions and yeah I think so so standards are you know uh, best practice guides, um, they're voluntary to follow, and the way that um, standards are written, um, like through, through BSI and, and um, ISO, which um, International Standards Organization, which um, BSI is like the UK body that reports into, is through consensus by experts, they're not written by standards bodies, and through that mechanism should be kind of learning from experience on the ground. I think one of the great opportunities we have is to start thinking about things early and not be reactive and the, the, this you know pe people like yourselves obviously are thinking about it in the biosecurity space um, people often you know say that you know innovate um, innovation is like stifled by standards and regulation but actually they can really go hand in hand because um, research... think about semiconductor chips even like yeah. the, the standards industry set the path for what needs to be true yes. to enable Moore's Law 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And so a lot of it does seem like it's thinking ahead Yeah, what yeah. we need. Exactly, and, and standards, because they're developed by consensus internationally, take like two years to develop. Um, it's a special process and it's an important process. Um, and also we can you know, use research today to see what's gonna be coming onto the market and the horizon, and, and we should be doing that rather than, than being reactive. And um, there's a lot of call for standards in um, AI safety space at the moment, um, but they're kind of being developed by many different uh, governments, private companies, um, all at the same time. And so it's important that we kind of have some sort of harmonization as well, because like in the computer world, the kind of bio world and the, the bio computer interface world doesn't necessarily respect uh, jurisdiction borders. And so we, we, we need to kind of have a, a global approach to it, I, th I think. Switching gears a little bit to data. Mm. I obviously, believe, like, in some ways, we're protected from some of the threats that, you know, Matt is highlighting from a misuse perspective because we just aren't good enough at engineering biology. It's still really hard. It's really expensive. Not that many places can do it. We don't have enough data to make these AI models all that powerful. And like, in some ways, that's a layer of protection. And as someone who's trying to do good work in this space, there's a part of me that wishes there was massively more biological data that we could use. There's also a part of me that's absolutely terrified about the idea of like Twitter for biological data. Um, and so how do you think about data as part of that kind of risk chain or, or what we need to be thinking about as we're moving forward in this space? 
Yeah, no, I mean, so data does underpin a lot of scientific progress and it uh, is a major bottleneck for a lot of, a lot of AI tools in this space is, is actual the data sets on which they're trained. Um, and having, having things in the open source is very good for, for advancing science, but it also can enable uh, misuse risks as well. Uh, and so I think we, we really need to decide as a society of what we actually want uh, people to have access to. Um, and what we don't want them to have access to. And I, I think this, 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 uh, this includes data, but even more so the tools that are trained on that data and uh, what, what their capabilities are. Um, and I think there's, there's a major role in actually determining uh, legitimate use and, and a legitimate user of, of, of both data and, and tools. And uh, wouldn't want to stifle the ability for us to be progressing on this field um, uh, w w with legitimate users. But at the same time, do we do we really want a world in which you know you could design a dangerous biological agent? And uh, in intervening at the point of data sets themselves can be quite tricky. I think it's impossible, in fact, <laughs> for, for for things that have already been open source. Uh, there's something else to be said for 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 data that's going to be generated in the in the coming coming decade, uh, through, through through especially as uh, AI is is enabling our ability to actually generate more data and more 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 calibrated data sets as well too. I do think there is a role for us to be able to say uh, whether or not we want to have access controls, though, in particular on the tools themselves that are trained on this data. And uh, we have a lot we can learn from, from national security, but also cybersecurity as well, too. I mean, there's, there's uh, concepts that you, you, you could speak to much better than me with regards to things like you know, principles of least privilege, of just going, w w why don't we just restrict access to the people that need to perform a task, and, and, and thinking through on various things within authentication and encryption. I do think, I do think we just really need in, in biosecurity to be uh, learning from fields that have really championed this forward of going, let's actually do proper risk assessment, let's actually uh, apply the control me measures necessary so that we, uh, we don't end up in a world in which, which, which we're having risk increase. So on, I think we need to be very careful in this space though not to uh, damage the, I mean, you started from the fact that having the data is absolutely critical and if we're going to um, see the, the biotechnology fields develop in the positive ways that we would like them to, that we need more data and we need to be able to enter the widest group of people think the unthought about that data set. And in, in, in a, another aspect of biosecurity that we haven't touched on at all, and perhaps it's like outside the remit here, but um, the security of biodiversity, it's like, is the planet gonna be, remain biodiverse enough and can, how do we understand biodiversity? We need to, we do, we're in the middle of really just mapping out what are the genomic sequences of all of the species um, um, so that we can understand that biodiversity in, in really exciting new ways. And anything that, so, that serves to stifle access to that type of data set or data sets about disease or risk um, is, has got massive negative consequences. So anything that we do to limit data access has got to be, uh, the bar's got to be set extremely high, I think. Um, and this, this is an international conversation as well, and there's things like the digital sequence information um, uh, rules that have been set internationally now agreeing how digital sequence information will be shared and the benefits that come from it will be shared are important to honor. There's also the, I mean, there's a problem if you try and limit access to data how able are you actually to do that? Um, and it's, it's very hard, and Matt was saying that in general, pe people use things for nefarious outcomes. Um, they will normally find the data if they want it, um, if they're determined to do a nefarious outcome. And especially in a field where the knowledge is developing so quickly, even if you try and hide something, they'll just rediscover it, and they'll go around you and, and find it again. Mm -hmm. So open access to data seems more important as a tenant here than than controlling data to me. Can I, can I be super oh, nerdy oh, for one yeah. second on this? So I, like, I think it's very cool, like the standards to controls to what is what are we actually mapping conversation is like exactly where we need to be, how we need to be thinking about this. And I, I like posit we're like in the 1950s of high altitude imagery or satellite imagery, right? Because what is DNA? It's a high fidelity information asset. ATCG, like Anna Marie started with, codes everything on the planet. Codes all the biodiversity. Forget humans. Humans are boring. We all have the same DNA, basically. Right? Like that's boring. High, but DNA of every anything else, DNA RNA, is is a high fidelity data asset that we now just barely have the ability to take pictures of with a DNA sequencer. We just barely have the ability to build data assets. This isn't like this is like 19, literally 1950s of like a high altitude camera building a U2 spy plane around it just to get it up high enough to use it. And so we have time. 
we have time as these data sets get built, as the ability to take pictures of essentially the biodiversity of the planet and understand then how that code turns into life. Like we can put standards in place, we can control the models, we can decide how fast or how slow we are creating the data assets. But I, I think like that that mindset that we are, you know, it's like the matrix. It should have been made with ATCs and Gs <laughs> and DNA, not zeros and ones. It's like it's it's actually how the planet's built. And it kind of was. It kind of yeah. was. Yeah, <laughs> it's fair. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. So I think yeah. that's where we are. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no, no. I, yeah, I just love to respond to both of you. You know, I, I, I do, I do, I, I do think it would be actually quite difficult to, to control access to data. And like you said, uh, people will recreate data sets as it goes forward. I do think there is still a role for us to 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 make that decision, just uh, just uh, pragmatically, as well as thinking about the tools that are trained on that data and about control access there. Again, uh, do you want? that to just be able to be uh, open source that you can actually have dangerous capabilities. I think w one way that we can learn about this from, 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 from other, uh, other risks that we've faced before <laughs> as, as a species, you know, it, it, think about a world in which everyone has the access to the information and the materials to make, uh, to make nuclear weapons. Uh, eventually, at some point, you can, you can pretty safely assume that you'll have a nuke go off if everyone had access. Uh, and I think we should think on this just very carefully about we've been able to restrict material access here. We, uh, we've been able to, uh, you know, mostly restrict information access. Biology's just tried, uh, going so far ahead with regards to our ability to, to restrict both of those categories. And I think us thinking with regards to uh, what you could actually, do, as we generate more information, maybe we just need to restrict the ability to actually build dangerous things. And we, we've done a lot of thinking with regards to uh, how we could do this from um, securing synthetic DNA and, and access, to, uh, access to synthetic DNA. But I do think there's another side of this too, which is, which is the models themselves that can be using, using this information. I'm really glad you raised the biodiversity mm -hmm. point. I don't think it's, it's talked about enough. Um, and something we should be bringing into this conversation, obviously from a global health and food security perspective. Um, but it is one of those just also, just to nerd out for a second on the power of biology, it's one of those incredible things that is not even necessarily visible to us. Uh, I, I spent the summer down in Costa Rica, and there's a, there are a bunch of researchers down there studying insect populations down there. A teeny little country has like 4% of the world's biodiversity. And they found that species that we once considered one species are actually 27 different species, and they look identical, but it turns out they eat slightly different bugs. And so we used to think this one species ate like 27 different bugs, and it turns out there are 27 species, each of which eat one bug, and, and you realize just how detailed and interconnected and complicated this stuff is. And, and all of that is the kind of data and, and insight that we need to be generating um, and monitoring and understanding if, if we want to move forward. That's Have we got time for another couple of examples like that? Please. Yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> Biodiversity so, is awesome. So, well, well, two aspects. I mean, so triggered by your comment about one, what was thought to be one species and the genetic diversity within that, uh, ash dieback is a, a plant pathogen that has caused decimation to a, one of our most important trees in the country. But we were able to identify within that species the genetic diversity to, to find some, some types of ash that were uh, resistant to ash dieback and then plant those trees and make sure that we have a maintained ash population in the, in the, um, in the UK. So that's an example of recognizing the power of the, gen the genetic information and harnessing it um, for nature effectively. But we also see um, that happening in terms of drug development, that what we know about genetics um, is bringing us countless new drugs and medicines and materials. You mentioned those that come from plants in your lecture. There's a, uh, a cancer drug that came from a marine sponge, which I quite often use as an example. There are lots of marine examples where we were able to use the genetic information from an unusual creature to make a really important new drug. And AI is really helping in that process, that, that sort of drug discovery area. It's something where machines are actually more able to do some of the hard work than we are. Absolutely. Can I do one? You can. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to remind folks that in just a couple minutes, I'm going to turn it over for audience Q&A. <laughs> so get those questions in your OK, mind. so um, one of our colleagues who's sitting here, uh, Cassandra Phillipson, who um, runs all of Ginkgo's like, comp bio, um, bioinformatics, like high-end data analytics for those that are not in the bio land, but like read what's coming off of the sequencer and figure it out. She was just explaining to me, because as you might have guessed, I am a history major, not a scientist. Um, like, we're doing all this wastewater collection. In wastewater, we're finding, like, we can find, like, thousands and thousands and thousands of these, like, viruses that kill bacteria, right? Phages. They look like the lunar lander, right? And the, 
like we have like a few antibiotics, but like there's a bunch of great viruses out there just like in the biodiversity of the planet that are just like assassinating bad bacteria all the time. <laughs> so like you know, we're gonna have this antibiotic crisis, et cetera, but this is a programmed virus that goes after something that is you know, it, essentially one of the few things that could cause massive pain and suffering in humanity. And oh, by the way, it's just like floating around in like the, the crap puddles, right? <laughs> like, and all we gotta do is read the code. I'm trying to think about all the things, but whatever. But you're like, you try to, you get the, the genetic code there programmed to one of these major problems. It all mm -hmm. comes from this like weird system that we don't even pay attention to. And it's super neat. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Um, I see a question over here. I think there's some folks that have mics wandering around. This is great. We have lots of questions, um, so I'll go over here in the, towards the wall. Sorry, it's a hard one to reach first. Thank you. Um, my name is Sana. I'm a researcher from RAN Europe. I really, really enjoyed the panel. Thank you so much. That was um, super fun to listen to. Um, I was really intrigued by some of the concepts that were discussed on um, distributed risk and distributed technology as well, and then talking about national security. And I guess my question, or I guess it's a bit more of a pondering, is that what should be within the scope of national security? Because given all the things that we've discussed, do you think everything biologically driven, given how pervasive it is, and the multiple sectors that it touches upon should be a concern for national security? And then you also talked about defensive measures. Do you think defensive measures are enough? Because um, what if um, national actors, which you mentioned is like, that's, that's the threat, right? National, we're looking at national actors. If national actors are working on self-fortification, where you're kind of um, you know, building food resilience and security and becoming self-sustaining, or maybe you're monopolizing an economic market or you know, um, becoming more intelligent and really healthy over time, is that a concern for national security as well? And are defensive measures um, warranted in that scenario? Just some things that um, thought might be worth pondering over. Thanks. I have strong opinions, but I would yeah. defer to others first. Go ahead. Are you, I don't know who's going to go first. I'll, I'll quickly touch on a couple of points that you raised, but I think that there's material in your question for all of us, probably. So you, you talked about sort of food security, and that's my patch, and, and that's one of the areas where um, hostile actors might choose to use these technologies for bad outcomes. And you can imagine targeting a particular crop, which is important to a country. Foot and mouth disease was mentioned in the, I think, I think that was the disease you were referring to when you uh, were talking in lecture. Manufacturing that sort of disease in, another, in a country that you were hostile to uh, is theoretically quite possible. So we do need to be aware of those sorts of, those sorts of risks in, in that sector. But I do think we, we need to also be very careful to think about biosecurity, not just about hostile na nations attacking us, but actually the most immediate biosecurity threats we have at the moment come from natural, natural um, attackers, so the, the diseases that we need to protect our countries and our crops and our people from. Um, that, that's a, a more pressing form of biosecurity in my view. Yeah, I, I would say, like, so here's like a, 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 like a, a thought exercise on how to put this question into a bigger structure. But the first thing I'll say is, I do fundamentally believe, and I think we should all look at each other and say this to ourselves, we should demand and continue to demand, whether it's policy regulation and also what our countries invest in, that biology is the first category in human history that we demand as defensive only from a military technology perspective. We just have to keep demanding that. There should be no hesitation on it. If bad actors are gonna do it, we should, we should hold them accountable, but we should, we should demand from our politicians, from our defense infrastructure that's defense only. So I just wanna say that very, very clearly. That, that's, a, that's a strongly held belief of mine personally, our company, but I think just we should all agree on that. The second, I think, so here's like the, the interesting way to think about it. When I say national security, I mean like a broad umbrella, and, it's, and certainly in the West, we think about um, the purpose of national security is to defend borders, you from me, us from them, um, kind of situation, and all of our uh, economic well-being. So it is, it do, national security exists as a function to allow society to flourish and to protect us from each other and, and other bad actors. So the way we've done this is we basically created domains when those domains become relevant to economic growth and to security growth. So C was the first one. We have land, air, space, sea, cyber. They are 
operational domains. NATO classifies them as operational domains. And they are basically become operational domains when we have the technology to exist within them. And that, I mean humans, right? So we have the ability to do economic things and national security things. So space became a domain. It's the most recent in NATO because we now have the ability commercially to engage in space. And it's a national security concern to make sure that, that co those commercial engagements and, and otherwise are done in a, an appropriate way. So I actually think the thought bubble exercise here is, is biology a domain, thus national security must think about its role existing within the domain. And the, the access point is that we can now engineer biology in a novel way. That's new technology, right? And just to put a pin in it, if you read the documents, um, and this is also in the Biodefense Posture Review, but it's, there's a bunch of primary literature on it, um, good or bad or ugly, China has declared that biology is an operational domain of warfare. It is in their strategy documents. We have not goes, gone so far as to declare that yet, but in the bi US Defense Department's Biodefense Posture Review, it names that and it says, we're kind of like not averse to the option of declaring this an operational domain where then why is that important? Because all levers of national power from economic to security to technology development to budget get oriented around how do I operate within that space as opposed to saying, oh no, it's this little agency over here that just does like research and that's where we put all the scientists. And so that's a big mindset shift. It's a, it's a hard one because we have to start with the first principle, which is unlike cyberspace, air, land, sea, which both have offense and defense. This has to be the only defensive only domain, like, and we should demand that. We've, I mean, would you, how would you say we've done with that on chemistry, for example? Obviously, we, mistakes were made historically. How are we doing? Uh, Professor Anderson, I, you, you made a comment, but I'm. I'm well, I think, I think we haven't kept it in the box. And I, although I think I agree with Matt that we should certainly try and keep biology in the box, I also agree with you that there are, I don't know if there are none, but there are certainly very few examples of people sort of, you know, the mass of humanity choosing to totally ignore it, what could be used as a weapon, sadly. Um, right next to the lav mic there, gentlemen, stand up. Thank you. Um, Anna-Marie, could I ask you to just clarify a thing? So in your, in your talk, you, were, um, you had that, that graph with, um, at one end, the precautionary principle, and you appeared to be equating that to a moratorium. From, I mean, I, my understanding, maybe this is a European-US sort of difference, the panel has been building quite a good case for the use of the precautionary principle. So could you just clarify the differences as you see them between a precautionary principle and a moratorium? I would honestly just restate what Professor Henderson just said. I think this technology is very hard to keep in a box. And so I think if you end up in a world where responsible actors are the ones who are not working on this technology, and irresponsible actors are the ones who are, that that is extremely short-sighted. And so we need to be investing in this technology, both its opportunities and its risks, at the level of government, at the level of large, responsible platform providers, in order to build the types of technologies that hopefully will protect, protect us, whether from irresponsible or malicious actors or from Nature. Uh, too many options. Uh, gentleman in the back right there. You said we can maybe demand that this operational domain of biology be the only defense only um, domain. I want to push on why it's that special, because maybe you have cascading consequence mutations, but that's also true of, say, for nuclear weapons, where you have radioactive waste that spill out in other ways. So is there really a resilient case why biology would be special like that? I mean, not to, not to be short shrift about it, but I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in a world where there's nation states who are, that it's kind of generally accepted that our nation states and others are actively developing biological weapons that can target me, my friends, my family, my country, like humanity. So, like, I don't want to live in a world where there's like a lot of weapons anyway, but like that one particularly, and we haven't done it yet, and we've been trying to stop it, so like I'd like to stop that. And I think the second, like, more thoughtful, uh, maybe not more thoughtful, different, different thought on it is, uh, like, we don't have to, right? There's plenty of, if you have the ability to do detection, attribution, you understand where things come from, well, like we've figured out deterrence. 
we've, we've figured out how to create both the disincentive of investment, but also the kind of, and there's a whole theory on this in deterrence theory, right? And the, like the, the punishment piece with things that are not, that do not have like humanity destroying potential to deter and, re and increase the, increase the um, uh, pain to any given actor of, of using these types of weapons. So I think we have other ways to do that. But like generally, I, I think this is one of those human questions. Like we're made out of biology. Like it feels like a really bad idea. I'm also okay. curious, maybe just going back to the opportunity side of the equation for a second. Like, why do we have war? Why do they strive? <laughs> like, it, it, but, but seriously, it's like we have inequality. There, there's a power hunger thing, but we have like scarcity of resources, and people want more resources. Biology does not have to be a scarce resource, and and it is today because there are geographic limitations. You know. If we can get better at engineering biology, we can make the resources that come from biology, our food, a lot of our economic potential, our climate, a less scarce resource. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I think we'll find other, like humans or humans, we'll find other things to fight over, but like. <laughs> I like to be But like, but there, is a, like there is this like foundational thing, like a post-scarcity economy, right? It creates other political challenges, right? Like, it, but it does, like there, there, there is a real positive benefit but there is something between um, between that um, the opportunity that you've brought us back to and the nation state hostile actor, and I've said this and recently, but I'll say it again. When the, the, the area of perhaps greatest opportunity in biosecurity is around health, around human health, yeah. and around animal and plant health as well, and there there we can use the combined knowledge that we now have about about genetics and um, the tools of AI to really make a revolution in how much we can look after human animal health, both by drug design, but also by surveillance, using some of the tools we've talked about. We should about. definitely outlaw infectious disease. Like, it's insanity that we still have <laughs> infectious disease. Right? Like, th that's just like pure public health yeah. healthcare. Like, yeah. that is, a, that is a, a piece of exhaust of putting national security dollars into this. And I think we should aim for that. Yeah. Like, 100%. <laughs> As a species. Well, uh, yeah. The viruses that are able to eat bacteria, we're still going to we're going to allow them, right? Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. They're, they're okay. So, if it's infecting the right thing, then it's all right. I think this is not infecting humans. <laughs> this is right. Um, in the back there. Hey, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Lots to learn. Uh, my name is Bhargav. I'm a senior research fellow at IPPR, Progressive Policy Think Tank here in London. Uh, my question is a little bit more about economic security. So some of you have touched upon this. In fact, you just touched upon this when you talked about scarcity. Question also for Gideon, a little bit for Anna. So, you know, we've already had incredible advances in uh, food, in medicine, but access to healthcare and food is still fraught in most parts of the Western world. I mean, the U.S. has an absolute healthcare system. Um, from there, some allowed to say that. Um, and we've also, you know, so if we do have like highly specific gene edited medicine, but only for the wealthy, and the masses have uh, basic drugs. You know, in cyberpunk futures, you have high tech, but low quality life. Um, so I'm just curious, uh, will cheaper production of medicines and food uh, make food and medicines cheaper or shareholders richer? And you know, how do we make sure we don't fall into that trap? And uh, what is your kind of broad, I think, policy stance? I'm curious, Gideon, you know, you mentioned uh, about uh, public access to data. I strongly, you know, I'm very much for that, especially, uh, you know, in, done in a controlled way, of course. Not everyone can get access to it, but you apply similar to a grant, you get access. So I'm just curious, uh, in our, we put out a report at IPPR on AI and public value. Um, and, you know, I'm just curious what kind of positive public value visions we can build for economic security. I know not directly related to biosecurity, but I'm curious for your thoughts. Yeah. Um, I can maybe start. Uh, there's actually an interesting interplay maybe here with the national security angle. Actually, and I know you were joking, saying like outlaw infectious disease, but there is something to, if you believe that having broad equal access to health care and to food and things like that are a national security priority for you, an economic priority for you, for your, your country, you make different types of investments. Um, in drug discovery today, there's something called Arum's Law. It's the inverse of Moore's Law. It's Moore's Law spelled back backwards, which is basically the number of drugs discovered per billion dollars. It's going way, 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 way down. Um, it's become much more expensive to develop new medicines. And to me, that's, 
that's criminal. Like we need to be, one of the reasons we need to understand this technology better is so that we can develop better medicines for all. Like we know biology is capable of it, that's the thing. Like it, it does it for us already for free at a global scale. And we're just not good enough at it to pro proactively engineer that and make it available um, for all. And, and I'd be curious, actually, Professor Henderson, you know, on, on your take on this more broadly and from a policy perspective, but there is an interesting conflict here as well. Like, take organic food. Like, we, we would all love to have less chemicals on our food, but like, it's more expensive. What are the technologies that are going to allow us <laughs> to actually have healthier, more sustainable food for all? It, it, it is biology. Like, we have to be making these types of investments. We have to be doing it with trust. Um, it's, it's the only thing that is capable of doing that. So I could talk for the next half an hour about uh, the, <laughs> the benefits of precision breeding rel relative to um, also organic approaches. But I, I'll try and respond to the question. For, sorry not to get um, drawn into that. But um, I, I think there is, a, there is a real danger here that uh, only some countries have got the ability to harness these tools and use them for out good outcomes. And it's, it, was, it will almost definitely lead to greater inequality internationally as some countries can harness this genetic information as we understand it much more effectively and build the drugs and sell them and make the money and enhance their own livelihoods. And that's why things like the, um, the agreements around digital sequence information and, the, and at least the um, intention to share the benefits that come from that internationally are very important. Realizing those intentions is gonna be a challenge, but I think it's one that we need to lean into. Although I would argue that national security has benefited from global stability. And my hope would be that if these tools do get good enough and cheap enough, that part of a national security strategy is not just dominating <laughs> your competitors, that you, do, you, you are able to start thinking about it in the sense of if we have more stability elsewhere, we will also be more stable here. Couldn't agree more. I think we're out of time. Um, I think we'll be around afterwards if there are additional questions, but thank you all for joining us.